The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Welcome old-time radio lovers to the Boxcar 7-Eleven old-time radio pod. I am Bob Camardella, your host, and for the next hour or so, your guide, as we travel back in time, back before TV was, to the golden age of radio. Another of the fine early shows of radio, this 15-minute series was created and transcribed by the Los Angeles company Transco, an unheralded early pioneer of radio production. It first was aired on radio station KFWB in Los Angeles. Unfortunately, the names of the many talents who created this show are lost like a ruin in the steamy jungles of time. The setting is the plush and highly decorated World Adventurers Club, where members relax and regale each other with their exploits in distant and exotic places. One can imagine that Phineas Fogg's Explorers Club in London might have been a model. In our World Adventurers Club, in San Francisco, perhaps next door to the hotel where once stayed the man called Paladin, one can imagine gentlemen with brandy and cigars reclining in overstuffed leather couches and chairs, the room lined with mahogany bookcases. Tall red velvet draped windows throw dim sunlight on walls covered with strangle masks and hand weapons, while statues in the corners stare out between potted palm fronds. There's even an explorer quartet to sing of adventure. Ah, the wild world that still lay in wait in 1932. In fact, alternate titles for the show were Adventures in a Strange Land, as well as The Adventurers Club. Adventurers Club bids you welcome. You are invited to join an informal gathering of this international organization whose members have explored all the strange lands of the earth, from the Russian steppes to Madagascar. Here you will meet men who have dared adventure in every form. Explorers, travelers, big game hunters, war correspondents, and international diplomats. The members of the club invite you to pull up a chair and listen to a tale of the royal road to adventure. Up with the Jolly Roger boys, and off we go to sea. There's heaps of fun when the Jolly Roger's hung, and the wind is on the lee, and the wind is on the lee. Blow high, blow low, it's off to sea we go, without a single light in the pale moonlight. Us bold buccaneers will go. Here's to each man, each man of the Jolly Jolly crew, We'll sail the deep blue sea, we'll sail the deep blue sea, sail the deep blue sea. We'll the jolly jolly rider find bold and free, and the pride of the Spanish name may be. And then home we come, yo ho, yo ho. And the girls will be waiting on the key. I know. For the man who sails the main, for the man who sails the main, so ho, 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 Oh, Dr. Roberts, have you met Mr. Nelson? I think not. How do you do, sir? How do you do, doctor? Our friend Nelson joined the club while you were away on your last expedition, doctor. Oh, is that so? Yes. I've heard of that expedition in New Guinea, wasn't it? Yes, uh, Papua, to be exact. Few people realize that Papua is the second largest island in the world, second only to Australia. Mention Papua, and most people visualize it as a small island of the South Seas. Instead, it's an immense place of bush and jungles and mountains. It's due north of Australia and just below the equator. I notice that most of the cartographers designate it as New Guinea, but I prefer the original name of Papua. Gentlemen, I suggest that we draw up some chairs and ask Dr. Roberts to go on with his story of Papua. Oh, well, now, just a minute. I had no intention of giving a discourse on that expedition. I'm afraid you can't avoid it, Doctor. It's been six months, and you've circled the globe since you visited the club, Doctor. I think he's due to explain where he's been. How about it, boys? That's right. It's up to you, Doctor. Come on, Doctor, please. Now, give an account of it. Well, gentlemen, this is very impromptu, but if you do want to hear about Papua, I can tell you some things that'll make your hair stand on end. First of all, my object in going into the little-known interior of that country was to reach a native tribe that had not been seen by white men. 
It was my desire to visit them as a friend, observe their mode of life, and, if possible, bring back to civilization with me one or two of these natives who had never been touched by the white man's world. This I succeeded in doing, but in a method that I never anticipated. If I'd have foreseen the perils of that trip, I doubt if I could have been forced to take it. Yes, that's what you say now. But if you had it to do all over again, I'll wager you'd be ready to leave for Papua today. Mm, perhaps so. There's no appeal like that of adventure. At any rate, I had an unusual expedition. I wanted to make speed, and I found speed absolutely impossible. It takes weeks to batter through the jungle, and the rivers are sluggish and full of crocodiles. So I tried a new idea. I got a small hydroplane, fitted it out at Mabu on the coast with a crew of two white men, and I was ready for Papua. You mean to say there were only three men, including yourself, in your expedition? That's all. It meant that we didn't have to depend upon natives, and that was a blessing, as I never can get black boys to work hard for me. With the hydroplane, we could fly over the jungles as long as we followed the general course of the river. Whenever we wished to land, it was a case of dropping down on the surface of the water. I carried enough supplies for a week of cruising and figured that I could accomplish the purpose of the expedition in that time. Simple, wasn't it? An excellent idea. I had a base established about 200 miles upstream where I could replenish gasoline and other supplies. And then we headed the plane's nose for the heart of the unknown. My companions were Jackson, a pilot, and Gale, a navigator. For hours, we flew over an impassable jungle, always keeping within sight of a broad river in case we had to make an emergency landing. Several times, we dropped down at villages. They had never seen an airplane before, and most of these natives were panic-stricken. As we progressed toward the interior, all signs of life disappeared, and I knew that we had passed the farthest exploration point of white men. To look down upon a land that no man of your race has ever seen before is a thrill, gentlemen, that cannot be described, but must be experienced. That must be a moment that comes once in a lifetime. And of course you had no idea what you might encounter. A tropical storm would have been mighty dangerous. Well, we were very lucky. After eight hours of flying, we saw a huge native village below us. We circled the place and decided to risk a landing. We had no means of knowing if the natives were hostile, but we decided to gamble our skill with theirs, and so we dropped down. And... Nicely done, Gail. Now, let's taxi up there to what appears to be the landing place for the native dugout. Yes, sir. I don't think those natives are hostile, Dr. Roberts. Neither do I, sir. But I wish they showed a little more fear. They certainly don't run for their lives the way most of them did. I'll call off the engine, sir, and bring her to by that large dugout. That's right. Uh, don't get too close to shore. Look at them. They're all crowding down to meet us. They're yelling something. Listen. Well, that means little to me. I think they're trying to welcome us. And that's be glad to see us, sir. Oh, there. There comes a chief, all dressed up in war paint and feathers. You boys keep an eye on him and don't let any of them touch the plane. Well, I can see him. I can find out about the people. Could you speak their language, Doctor? No. And I won't bore you, gentlemen, with the tedious procedure of trying to converse with those natives. I used two or three combined native dialects. And by making the savage repeat many times, and by guessing at almost half the words, I gathered his meaning. It seems that he was not the chief, but a kind of medicine man. He was a doctor for his people, as I am for mine. But unfortunately, you weren't from the same medical college. <laughs> not by a wide margin. But he made me understand that his chief was very ill, and he had cast a spell to cure the chief. He thought that our appearance out of a clear sky, so to speak, was a token of good. He thought I had come to cure his chief, and he told the village that. Oh, so that's why they weren't antagonistic. Exactly. They thought it was some... I was some strange god that their medicine man had conjured to come and cure the dying chief. I was really a guest of honor. And did you visit the stricken chief, Doctor? I, I had to. There was no alternative. I left Gale with the plane, and Jackson and I went ashore. One look at the chief, and I knew he was a goner. It was beyond the power of medicine to save him. But I couldn't leave the village without incurring the natives' anger, so we spent the night ashore. I had Gale moor the plane securely, and the three of us were given a crude kind of a hut in the middle of the village. Well, so far, so good. I would say that luck was with you. So I hoped. Uh, but in the middle of the night, a terrible pandemonium broke out. There was yelling and screaming and drum beating, and we didn't know what to make of it. The medicine man appeared and motioned for us to follow him. He led us to a large elliptical hut, and we followed him inside. At first, I, I couldn't see much. But gradually, I became aware of the contents of that awful hut. It was lined with thousands of human heads, 
all grinning or shrunken and distorted in the most horrible grimaces, as if they had died in terrible agony. Great Scott. There we were, surrounded by a thousand mummified heads. Dozens of natives were watching us, and it was only too obvious that our heads were to be added to those of that terrible hut. You, I thought they looked upon you as a god. They did at first, but the medicine man told us that the chief had died an hour ago, and now they blamed us for his death. They meant to murder us as a sacrifice to the dead chief. They brandished huge clubs and knives, and in another minute we'd have been decapitated. Of course, in a moment like that, one acts first and thinks later. With a yell that equaled that of any of the savages, I whipped out a revolver and shot three of them on the spot. Justin did the same thing. And Gale picked up a war club and smashed a huge hole in the side of the hut. This sudden attack of ours surprised the natives for a brief moment, and we made a break for our lives. We rushed to the river in the plain, firing at anything we could see. Behind us, a thousand murderous, yelling headhunters came whooping. <laughs> Well, that was a lively night in Papua. <laughs> that would be enough to last me a lifetime. Well, we were all pretty scared, but we didn't have time to think about it. I'd say it was the most thrilling experience in my career. And in spite of our hurried exit, the expedition was successful. Uh, you remember I told you I wanted to bring one of the savages back to civilization with me? Yes. Well, I did. One of those who was trying to wreck the plane didn't get off in time. We were up in the air, and I hauled him on board and took him back to civilization as Exhibit A of a trip I shall never forget. Well, Dr. Roberts, that's a story I shall never forget. Nor I. Oh, it's an episode that might have happened to anyone. A dozen members of this club might tell a better story. I doubt it. But nevertheless, I don't intend to be absent at the next meeting. It's up to Jack Palmer to tell the next adventure story. Yes, Jack, you're next. You're going to tell us what you've been doing in China for the last two years. And that is going to be a story. The mighty jungle lord comes with a flashing sword. Crashing on footsteps of thunder, thunder Through this cathedral vast There rings a trumpet blast And all of nature pauses to wonder Oh, swiftly the little fleeting deer leap At the sound of following feet Leaping to fly, fearing say goodbye, the World Adventurers Club invites you to come to another meeting and hear one of its members tell of his strange adventures in strange lands.